open forum during Zoom meetings. The way to do that is to just type a chat uh, in the chat window, um, or you could, I suppose, raise your hand uh, and Pearl or Mr. Colabufo will uh, gather those up. But if you're gonna type something in the chat window, just let us know your name and the topic that you'd like to address uh, with the board tonight. And we'll, we'll get there pretty quickly after we start the meeting. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Pearl or Tom, if you can just keep an eye out for Mrs. Fishman. Um, yep, and Lori. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Yep, and, yep, and Lori. Um, so I'd like to call the meeting to order, ask everyone to stand where you are as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. And with that, I will make a motion to approve tonight's meeting agenda as stated. Can I get a second? Second. All right. Motion by Mr. Martin, second by Mr. Loy. Any discussion? Yes. All right. Mr. Martin is a yes. Uh, Mrs. Fishman, I don't believe is she here. is. She's on. She oh. is. Hello, Mrs. Fishman. Yes. Thank you. This is uh, Mrs. Wood is not here. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yeah. Mr. Loyer? Yes. Mr. Patch? Yes. And Mrs. Sunday? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Pearl, I'm doing them in the right order for you, right? Oh, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Uh, so we are at the Community Open Forum. Uh, Tom or Pearl, let me know if you see anything. I don't see anything at no, this time. I don't see any. All right. Excellent. Well, if, if someone does still need to do that, just type it in the chat. We'll address it closer to the end of the meeting. Uh, we just won't disrupt kind of the flow of things, though. Uh, with that, we'll move into our items. Um, can I get a motion for item D, personnel in its entirety? I'll make the motion. Loyer, I will second that. Uh, any discussion on D or any comments by Tom or staff? All right, Mr. Martin is a yes. Mrs. Fishman? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yes. Mr. Loyer? Yes. Mr. Patch? Yes. And Mrs. Sunday? Yes. Thank you. I'll make a motion to accept item E, the consent agenda in its entirety. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? Sorry, second by Mr. Loy. Any discussion on E? All right, Mr. Martin is a yes. Mrs. Fishman? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yes. Mr. Loy? Yes. Mr. Pat? Yes. And Mrs. Sundet? Is that a yes, Mrs. Sundet? Sorry. Yes. Ah, thank you. Very good. All right. And motion carries. Uh, so we'll move. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we move on, I just wanted to take a moment um, to acknowledge some thoughtful donations uh, to the district tonight, both monetary uh, and also a um, collection of Dr. Seuss books. So, Pearl, if you can arrange the thank you letters from the board, we will uh, be glad to send those out. We'll do that. Thank you. And with that, we'll move into special presentations. And Mr. Cole Buffo, I'll turn it over to you to introduce A. A. Cole. All right. Mr. Smolik and his crew are ready to go. Without further ado, I give you the A. A. Cole staff. Floor is yours, Michael. When you say my crew, hopefully you don't mean the crew upstairs. So um, <laughs> Jen should keep them under, uh, under wraps. So welcome, everybody. Uh, cozy group, cozy bunch. Uh, obviously, this isn't what we're used to. I uh, can't wait to see everybody again in person, uh, hopefully in the in the near future. So, you know, choosing school spotlights never an easy task, and obviously this year is no exception. There's so many wonderful things going on across the district, not just at AA Cole, but with all the professionals. The way that we've come together over the course of the past 12 months is really it's unreal. It's unlike anything 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 any of us ever could have imagined. And certainly it makes me proud to be a Central Square alum, uh, community resident, and, and an employee of the district. So I also want to 
give a big public shout out to my staff. Uh, they continue to rise to the challenge on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, you constantly ask yourself, how much more can I ask of people? And, and, and I really, I, I can't ask more of these people, it seems, yet they continue to come, uh, come to me with new and innovative ideas. So, and they're, they're doing their best to provide the highest quality education possible, obviously, for, for our kids given the circumstances. So, so when it came to choose the school spotlight this year, I know obviously we've had a lot of discussion, ongoing discussion at the administrative level, but also at the board level about remote learning, virtual learning, learning management systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I want to say, okay, what is something that sort of sets AA Cole apart? And this isn't something that's pandemic exclusive. As a matter of fact, this started just before our shutdown last year. And those are our parent nights at AA Cole. Um, really the premise behind the parent nights, uh, we had, what we found as a group, uh, we meet weekly as a student support team. And I'll get into who makes up the student support team. Uh, but in discussions with those professionals, as well as with the, the staff throughout the building, we found that there were oftentimes repeat topics when parents were seeking out school staff for advice. So we put our heads together. And again, the wonderful team of professionals with whom I work on a daily basis has decades of expertise. Um, and we're looking to share that with willing parents. Well, I'll be the first to say, and I know anybody on my team would say that as well, that we don't have all the answers. Uh, we're never going to proclaim to have all the answers. Um, but certainly we rely on experience. Um, you know, no two situations are exactly alike, but um, you know, over the decades of experience just with the student support team alone, uh, we've encountered similar situations and we lean on those uh, when putting together these parent nights. And then lastly, uh, it aligns perfectly with the board goal uh, number four in terms of fostering a relationship between the school and the community. I'm gonna go through a little bit about, you know, what makes up the parent nights, who participates in them, and some of the uh, topics that we've covered. So first and foremost, I mentioned my student support team before. Uh, we meet weekly, and the student support team is made up of myself, uh, Scott Phillips, my school psychologist, uh, Kristen Salmonson, who is our social worker, and Kristen split between a couple of different buildings this year. Beth Slozik is a counselor that's shared between Millard Hawk and myself. And, or Miller Hockney, excuse me. And then uh, we have the good fortune of having Michelle Stiles, who is a school based mental health clinician that we contract through Arise. Uh, additionally, we have some select staff members. I want to give public recognition to Ron Herney. Uh, you, you'll see when we get into some of the topics that we've covered thus far. Uh, Ron acts as a clear touch trainer and a canvas trainer for the district. And so when we put together our last uh, parent night, which was actually virtual in nature, on the 20th of November, uh, I went to Ron and asked, would you be willing to present? And without hesitation, he agreed to do so. Uh, so we'll bring in select staff members as needed. Certainly, um, all parents and guardians are invited to attend. And uh, ironically, ironically enough, it wasn't just AA Cole parents that we had. It was, some of them were maybe former AA Cole parents that attended our most recent one. Um, we send out flyers, blast messages. It's discussed at PTO meetings. Um, and then the PTO support, the AA Cole PTO certainly supports this. Um, I rely on them for idea generation. Uh, there's financial support. We, we offer door prizes for the attendees. Uh, they assist with uh, publicity. And then um, as an aside, during non-COVID times, we do use some title funds uh, to serve dinner to the attendees. So I talked a little bit about, you know, some of the ideas and the, the generation of topics. So for the topics, for the more, most recent topics or more recent topics, excuse me, that we've covered, um, first and foremost, tips and strategies for improving behavior at home. And this has a tendency to be a repeat topic with many of our, many of our parents and community members. Um, it was the one that we actually did first last year. We started this, let me get my dates right. Our first one last year was March 12th, which uh, coincidentally enough was our the day before our last day of normal in, in session school. Um, we had had about 34 people RSVP to the original date. Uh, there was a snow day on the original date or maybe after school activities were canceled. We ended up rescheduling to the 12th, which just happened to be right on the cusp of uh, closing down. And so we had several people pull out. We only ended up with about 
four attendees at that one. But I am pleased to, to report that our, our last one on the 20th of January, we had 36 attendees. Uh, so for people to sit down at their computer, and obviously there is the convenience of Zoom, uh, but for people to sit down at their computer and take an hour and a half out of their, out of their evening uh, to share strategies and to, to learn some new things uh, really means a lot. And I think it speaks volumes for the relationships we've been able to, to establish up on the North Shore. Um, another topic, the virtual learning tips and strategies that work. Uh, certainly this is a hot topic this year. Uh, it's been all over the news. I know some other um, administrative teams in our district have presented on this. Uh, again, Ron Herney assisted with this one. Uh, our counselor and our mental health clinician uh, presented on affecting, effective coping strategies for parents and kids. Uh, I really think that this group is in tune with the social emotional impact of this pandemic on everybody. Um, but sometimes that's brushed aside by, by some people. And just like the kids need uh, coping strategies, we adults sometimes need coping strategies. So these were some simple, straightforward things that we could share with parents uh, to, to help them and to help them as parents and as individuals uh, during these crazy times. And then lastly, and again, this was another one that Mr. Herney helped with, was the basic overview of instructional technology. Uh, sometimes we fear what we don't know. I'll be the first to say that I was not the Zoom expert, nor am I still the Zoom expert, but uh, a lot of on-the-job training as of late. Um, but I think there was a lot of apprehension early on with our parents and guardians because of fear, fear of the unknown. They didn't know the instructional technology, how to navigate it, uh, accessing things, how, where can I turn for support? Uh, so we decided that this was a very worthwhile topic. And so that was part of our most recent presentation. Bro, can you scroll down to the next slide? Or Connie, I'm not sure who's got it. It's in me. terms of planning for the future, thank you. So in terms of planning for the future, uh, I mentioned that we, with the topic selection, really it's parent driven. And um, I have the names of the attendees, you know, and I, I lean on some of those individuals. You know, what more do you want to hear about? We, we can survey the parents uh, at the end of the, at the end of the presentations and, and they really drive our, our plans here. And uh, the student support team as well. Again, we meet weekly. I'm in frequent communication uh, with the team and, and they're, they're my boots on the ground. They're, they're the ear uh, out in the community. Uh, but really, we don't want it to be a top down, you know, we're going, we're going to present on X, Y, and Z. Uh, it, it's really, what do, what do our parents need? What do our guardians need? Uh, in terms of the frequency, again, I mentioned that the first one was on the 12th of March last year. And unfortunately, it was uh, railroaded a little bit by the onset of the pandemic. Um, 36 at our last one. Uh, we are looking to do uh, at least one more between spring break and the end of this school year. Uh, it looks as though that would be presented via Zoom. Um, and then the sharing, in terms of the sharing of resources, the invitation for the last one was shared with the other elementary schools. Uh, and we've, I've shared this idea at the district outreach committee. You know, I think it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great way to bridge uh, school and home and uh, to show mutual support for one another. Uh, I started off by saying, you know, how many great professionals we've got around this around this district. So, you know, it's, it's my belief, what better way than to say, okay, this isn't something that has to be exclusive to AA Cole. You know, this is something that, hey, Brewerton parents can attend and, and high school parents can attend, middle school parents can attend, because we kind of approach it with a global perspective. Sure, there might be certain things that, that are elementary specific, but it doesn't mean that they can't be um, sort of shifted uh, to meet the needs of, of a second parent of a secondary student. So really that collaboration uh, and the sharing of resources is, is something that I'm looking forward to uh, in the future. Any questions on our parent nights? I don't have any questions. Board. And again, I'm not, this is certainly not something that's exclusive to AA Cole. I know other districts, other schools have done things along these lines, but it's really something I, I'm exceptionally proud of the work that we've done thus far and really looking forward to continue the work now and into the future. Mike, if I can just say, you have a definitely have a very tight knit group at AA Cole um, from the snow cone machines, which by the way, when we had our fifth grade extravaganza, you guys so generously allowed us 
the snow cone machines that you guys actually own that your your PTO does. It was the snow cone machines, and then there was a, another machine there. Cotton candy machine. Yeah, the cotton candy machine. But the events that go on across all of our buildings are pretty amazing, but especially the stuff that you guys have that go on uh, at AA Cole for the families. It's, it's a very community-based uh, environment. It's awesome. I, I appreciate that recognition, Tom. And, you know, that's been one of the hardest things. I, I told Matt Fisher, one of my PTO co-presidents, uh, as recently as last week, I go, who would have ever thought I'd miss PTO events and character education assemblies as much as I do, you know, as we knew them right. as much as we do, you know, and again, one of the many things we pride ourselves on. So thank you, Tom. You got it. Yeah. And I'll just echo the congrats, Mr. Smolnick, you know, so many parents, particularly because I live on the North shore. Um, I've heard amazing uh, compliments and just great things from parents this year. Um, and I know sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes negativity is the loudest voice uh, sometimes, but uh, trust me, the positivity is out there and, and people are really grateful. Uh, and I'm sure I speak for the whole board when I say that we are too. Uh, really good stuff. And um, thanks to the entire staff of AA Cole. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Any all other right. comments? As always, if you've got a question now or in the future, you know, never hesitate to reach out to me. I know everybody's got my contact information. It's a, it's a well, it's an open door of sorts, uh, but but you know how to get in touch with me. So certainly, I uh, I welcome any conversation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. With that, uh, I think it's on to Mrs. Ladd for a budget workshop, which yep. is uh, seems to be a weekly special enough right now. <laughs> yes, this is that time of year. I can I present for like what five months in a row, and then you don't hear from me for a while. <laughs> Tonight, I'm, I want to go into some of the details of the expenditure sides of the budget that we started with. What was it? Two weeks ago. Um, the first four screens are the same four screens as last time, and the detail lines, the rest of the budget, the 20 some pages are available on the website for everybody to review and look over. Um, again, it's a 85.9, almost an $86 million budget. Revenues, largest piece being state aid and the second part, largest piece being property taxes. Go ahead, Connie. These are the detail lines of those revenues that are in the pie charts. Um, go ahead, Connie. Tonight, what I really want to focus on is the big pieces of the pie and the, the expenditures right here. But 73% of our budget is made up of salary and benefits. And I want to take some time to go through what those are, because sometimes I think um, we forget how large we are and how many employees we have and what it takes to um, staff the um, public education system. Go ahead, Connie. These are the detailed expenditure lines that I'm um, talking about that are in the budget packet. And each one of these lines has details that make up the rest of the budget that's available online for anybody that's interested in revealing the details. Go ahead, Connie. So 73% of our budget is made up of salary and benefits. The salaries in this budget are just over $39 million. I just wanna go through who they are and where they are. At the elementary level, we have four elementary buildings. The K-5 staff, essentially the 74 that's on there are basically your classrooms. It's the classroom teachers. Um, there's three UPK classrooms. And then there's a Bridges program out of Cole. And then the special areas, the art, the music, um, PE and library are across, the specials are across all of those classrooms, so to speak. There are also nine AIS reading positions and each elementary building has a curriculum consultant. Go ahead, Connie. At the secondary level, at the middle school, is the top line and the high school is the line underneath. Um, grade six is usually, is pulled out separately 
due to the fact that they're still running kind of on an elementary style, um, what do I want to say, curriculum, but the grade seven and eight positions are there by, what do I want to say, by classroom. And then the secondary, at the secondary high school, they're also broken up by the content area. The special areas across both of the buildings, um, the CTE are separate, the tech and the business and the family consumer science. Then we have another 10 positions of language. And then there's five positions, AIS and reading. Go ahead, Con. Across all of those buildings and across all those positions, the special ed teachers are in the buildings. There are 45 special ed teachers and another teacher that's special ed with the general ed teacher in the Bridges program. We have eight speech positions. We have five OTPTs and seven school psychs. Also across the district, I'm put, pulling this out separately, are our mental health positions. We have nine school counselors, social worker, and social worker assistants. So that total teaching staff is right at 320. And then we add in our other positions. We have a unit called non-instructional supervisors, which is um, the food service, the maintenance, the transportation positions, our technology. Every building has a nurse and we have um, full-time and part-time monitors in all the buildings. The teaching assistants are another large set of staff. The bulk of our positions are, as you can see, they're in the special ed program. 112 special ed positions our teach, of teaching assistants exist. These move up and down. You see them on board packets every month, depending on the needs of the students. And then we have another 20 positions across the district. So that's a large set of staff. These are the building clerical. There's a couple of 10 month positions still out there, but the bulk of the clerical positions are 12 months. Um, and these are district office clerical. We, these are separate from the building clerical. Um, they're more likely to be accountants, personnel assistants, um, registrar. They have different titles, different civil service titles. The buildings and grounds and custodial unit is made up of 48 custodians. And then we have six ground keepers and five maintenance workers. Transportation is another large unit. There's 92 people in transportation. Obviously the bulk of them are the bus drivers. There are five mechanics down there and 17 bus monitors right now. The administrators, there's one in each building at the elementary level. Um, three at the middle school and four at the high school. And the AD is in that unit also. And there are six positions um, that have individual contracts. And that makes up the bulk of our staff. I want, I always try to put here that right here, you can see this year, the grant supported salaries. So if the bulk of the staff are in the general fund budget. But depending on what the grants support every year and how much they are, some of these positions flow in and out of being paid by grants. This year we've got, um, what is it, 12, 21 and a half FTEs that are in the grants. Just to highlight again, some of the items of interest that we've talked about already or have, we'll get into. It is a large budget increase. We talked about it last time, 5.7%. This is due to the debt and the building aid coming at, into the budget that's associated with the, the $40.8 million capital project. The tax levy increase is at zero. Um, and we're using appropriated fund balance that, was, that we held from last year to make sure that we would be able to get through this year. And it also includes the federal stimulus dollars. So Maureen, can I just make a quick comment on that slide? Because mm -hmm. again, and I know we did a similar thing last week, but uh, for anyone from the community, it's really important because, you know, while the tax levy may have been listed, I think third on that previous slide, 
the tax levy is zero. So as far as the projected right, as of right now, but likely the budget we put forward will have a 0% tax levy increase. The budget going up, that, that would be like saying, uh, buying a car one month and then acting surprised the next month when the first payment is due. We knew that money was coming. We made the decision years ago before the pandemic. And it's not that that's any sort of surprise. It's not an increase in random spending. It's totally projected. It's not having an impact uh, that we didn't anticipate as far as the tax levy goes. And I just want to make sure that's clear because to, to someone who doesn't look at this very often, they could look at it and say, man, they're just spending money left and right. Like it's going out of style. That's not it at all. It's all been locked in for years. Yeah. And this right here, the screen reiterates that the seven, the 5.7 percent budget increase is due to the 2017 voter approved capital project. It's just coming online at this point. Go ahead, Connie. And right here, I'm trying to show it even clearer, like Andy, as you're just saying, the building aid on the revenue side, how large of an increase that is, and the um, it's transferred to other funds, but that's the debt service. It's highlighted on the expenditure side. So on both sides, it increases. This is um, the no tax levy increase. Very important that we're doing that this year. That, go ahead, Connie. That tax levy is made, or tax rate is made up of three parts. And the one part that the school district has some control over is the total levy. And we will be putting out a 0% levy increase. We also wanna make sure that everybody understands that we are using our fund balance as we planned with the unassigned fund balance from last year's year end. That actually, you see that does, designated fund balance going in there, but you can also basically say that we're using fund balance to put out the 0% levy. Also here, I want to make sure, and I've got it circled there to remind everybody that we are using the full amount of the federal stimulus funds that's included in the budget. It's being um, taken out of the foundation aid and supplemented with the stimulus money. And actually, that's the number that is a little bit, I want to say, iffy. But now that the package seems to be going through the feds to, and it seems like it is possibly going to be a good number for next year, which that's a real big relief. Yeah, Maureen, um, <clears throat> I talked with the Senator Schumer's uh, rep this afternoon in the budget that was passed. And I just want to reiterate to everybody that that the governor has taken this money is that it if the formula is the way he understands it, it will be double the second stimulus amount. So it's going to be $6 million, this next round of stimulus for education. So that's going to be a total, I think, of right around $10 million that the governor has the opportunity to take federal dollars and supplement it. it, it I just find it appalling um, if his past performance indicates anything going forward. That's a lot of money. It's a right, and they're basically using it to supplement what they would have been given us, or should, I guess you would say, give us. And yeah, I, I, yeah, my office is next to his office, and when he was told the money, because I, I asked him why he, I could hear him screaming <laughs> it, it being upset, is that he has taken this money and he is being made whole, being made whole by the federal government at, at a state level, so there is no reason for him to take this money. The money that he's taken so far, the money going forward, there is no reason for it. And I literally heard him scream and that's what I, I stopped. I said, hey, what are you screaming about? Because he's upset, he's mad that, he, that, he, that he's taken this money out of Central New York. But it's important you say that, Steve, because there's a massive misconception that people feel that because there's a Democrat in office and there's a Democratic governor, that that money's all coming to schools. I don't know how else Cuomo could have said that money's likely not coming. And maybe it won't be the 20%, but it's enough that's going to make us, like Maureen and I spoke about today, have to uh, battle for, back from this for at least four years is what we're, we're expecting. So I'm glad you made that. A, that's a good point. 
Yeah, and it's doubled the amount that the amount that they approved in the package will be doubled the second around. So that's it's roughly right, Maureen, is about 3.1, 3.2 million. So that'll be six million, six and a half. And it's just it's it's it I just can't I've said this before. I pay federal tax dollars. This isn't a gift. These are my federal tax dollars that are not going to the district. And I think about all the things that could with the challenges that are coming up ahead that $10 million could do an awful lot for the district mm -hmm. if we were just funded with the normal state aid plus the stimulus. It's not a stimulus if you take it away. Yeah, and I think <laughs> that's what's so hard for people to understand. They feel like we're getting all the stimulus money. What's going on? It's not. Yep. And, 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 and he, he, it's, it's upsetting. It really is. I, I'm, I'm twitching in my chair. I'm, I'm, I'm so mad that I don't understand how he could take this money, and he's taking it. And it and is stimulus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all right, I'll off my soapbox. Thanks. On this screen, I just put a list of items that we talk about in cabinet and with admin, but we really have to make fiscally responsible choices. Obviously, given this, um, the climate that we're in right now, we do still continue to experience declining enrollments. So we have had some retirements and these positions will be analyzed before they are filled. Because if we have declining enrollments in those areas, we will not fill them. We had a couple of years ago, a mental health initiative and a reading initiative. At this point, we're just holding them at this year's level. We're not moving them forward like we planned. Um, those stimulus funds are our supplementing foundation aid. They're not adding to our budget. Um, and that's what we've got to watch for is the revenue shifts with the state budget in April. We obviously won't adopt a budget until we get those April state numbers to know if they're going to remain the same or what they're going to do with them. And then we obviously have the big factor out there that we don't know what the COVID-19 regulations are going to do as far as impacting our budget both good and bad, up and down. Because obviously we're, there are items and things and initiatives that we're taking on that are costing us money, but there also are things that we are not doing that we would normally have in our budget. Yeah, Maureen, I, I think it's important also to mention, just like we were talking about the capital project and, and the impacts of that, you know, the reality is that the real impacts of what's happening right now are going to be seen next year, the year after that, you know, three years from now. And so when we talk about a 0% tax levy increase, I mean, we think it's as a board and as a district, we think it's important uh, based on what everyone's facing right now. But there is a risk to doing that too. We are very uncertain about what the next two, three, four years look like. And so I, I just don't want anyone to think it, it's done lightly. Um, and there are difficult decisions that are coming down the road, e even in a good scenario, there's, there are difficult decisions that are gonna have to be made. Yeah, definitely. Um, this last slide is, it comes from Forecast 5, which is the um, a program that we participate in. And it takes the five years of live birth rate and projects them out. And as you can see, we are still projecting enrollment declines, but they are starting to level off a little bit as compared to the last 10 years, but they do continue to show decline. And Maureen, in the, I, I don't know if you had a chance to compare, but in a quick look earlier today, when I went back um, five years or so to the different enrollment projections at that time, I mean, it's not that it's exactly spot on, but it's not far off. And we've pretty much done the trend line. Right. Yeah, we have been following it. And I always think it's interesting. I do the same thing because obviously every year when I make the new um, presentations, I'm putting the numbers on top of the old numbers so you can really see the trend lines as you do it. Yeah. And we're getting into the spot. You can go ahead, Connie. Um, where do we go from here? as far as long-term planning, because it's so uncertain. We do have some items that are out there that we will have some long-term um, decisions to make. Obviously, they, we still have CSI. We had been planning at different times, looking at special ed programming in that building or alternative ed 
programming in that building. And those items are still there for us to work on in the future. Um, future capital projects, as we discussed, this capital project now was voted on in 2017. Basically, you're supposed to look at the five-year um, building condition surveys and try to have projects every five years. So we're looking at the next year or two needing to have another project to keep us moving forward. Um, the Smart Schools Bond Act money is still there. We do have um, number two going on right now. The Pranethium boards, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, have been installed and we are in the midst of Smart Schools Bond Act number two coming to fruition. And there's probably going to be some permanent changes that are reflected as, you know, post COVID type of education things that we're going to have to deal with long term. So just some items that we have to get out there for planning. The 21 annual budget vote and school board election timeline is out. The budget vote is always the third Tuesday in May. It's going to be May 18th this year. And these are the dates that we have to hit with all of our requirements to get to the vote. And we're just coming into the first item, which is we next week we'll have to start running our first ad in our legal sections of the papers. Um, boards, school board candidate position nominations are due to Pearl on April 19th. And then we'll move forward from there. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? Helps if I come off mute. I guess one question I would have is, um, and I don't know, it's probably for Tom and maybe others as well, but um, we all know that, for instance, Onondaga County just reduced from six feet down to three feet, you know, with barriers. And um, we are certainly hopeful that Oswego County will follow that, but there's an impact on that. So, Tom, just what what would be the financial implications? And I know this some part of this may be already covered in your superintendent's report because I know you sent something out about barriers. But then what are the barriers to us being able to, you know, because with that distance, hopefully we'd be able to bring all the kids uh, back. But what are the barriers to that? Well, that's funny. You should say that because it looks like we, uh, we, we talked about this, but we didn't. So here's one of the barriers. Okay. So I want you to, as much as you can notice this, I'm sure you really can't um, from this angle. But what I want to show you is if I'm sitting and I'm facing that way, it comes off, it comes off roughly about six inches, six and a half inches to your side. So I'm, rather than show you that, it's gonna be difficult from this angle. Um, basically when you're seated, it'll come and it'll come behind about six and a half inches. So when you're seated and you look to the left and you look to the right, there's a barrier there. What I just showed you is $45, okay? If we get those, it's going to cost us $200,000 in our district. And that's not even counting Brewerton because Brewerton is part of Onondaga County and Onondaga County is paying for um, 524 of the barriers. Now we don't know what those barriers are going to look like, but there is another barrier that some school districts are looking at. Uh, there's no, this basically you can't really see through it. Um, and this is the barrier. This is a $20 barrier that I guess what we're hearing is kids are supposed to tape this down. Now, I'm not saying this is what Onondaga counties is. I'm simply saying the two big barriers that are out there is the $45 one that is like the Rolls Royce that is very sturdy and whatnot. And then this very flimsy one that's $20. If we go with the $20 one, then I'm just going to be honest with you, we won't because it's garbage and it doesn't even stand up when I set it down. I, I that right there would cost district $100,000. So any way you look at it, if we go with barriers, the price tag will be $200,000. Now we'll back up a little bit. The one part that every time they, uh, they ask me, will I take an interview? I'll say, I say yes, because somebody needs to loudly say the only way the districts can go back to full capacity in Oswego and Onondaga County is the busing part. They have to lift they have to lift the um, restrictions off the buses because even I was watching the press conference today with uh, Ryan McMahon, our dog County executive. And he said, Dr. Gupta and our dog County, they're looking at it. And basically they're where it is right now is 15 minutes. 
Um, if they're on the bus for 15 minutes, they kids can sit next to each other with the windows cracked open a little bit and wearing masks. But the problem is we have no bus runs that are 15 minutes. So it, that's going to be an issue. So we've already put surveys out at the elementary and in, in all honesty, um, we, we do not have a tremendous amount of parents that are able to transport their kids. So we put the surveys out because we wanted to just see, and again, that's not unique to our district. Every district put a survey out to see if they could have more in-person time. And that's all based on how many kids you can get into the buildings. So from, from the fall in Onondaga County, there were uh, a significant amount of uh, parents that were able to transport their kids, which meant the kids left on um, that would take the buses was very small. They can get them all in. So when people would call my office, and some still do, they say, how are the bigger schools able to get to do this, but we're not able to do it? Essentially, that's it. The biggest factor, and we've said this all year long, is how many parents want in-person learning for their kids and how many parents are able to actually transport their kids. So I don't want anyone to feel bad if they can't transport their kids because let's face it, a lot of people, they both work. It's a very hard thing to be able to do. But that's essentially what it is. So full transparency, that's, how, that's the, the biggest obstacle is busing. So if they lift the restrictions on busing, then we would essentially be able to return to full capacity if we pay the $200,000 for the, um, the barriers, that we'll be able to do that. But there definitely is a difference between the $45 barrier and the $20 barrier. And so, our, and that, so other than that, uh, busing and obviously the cost of the barriers, anything else that impacts our ability to bring all kids back or are we good, good to go? Well, there are some contractual things. You know, um, with the with the teacher's contract, it, there is the fir a first five minutes of the day that they have to not have kids in their room. That's part of the contract. Contracts are contract. So we would just have to creatively see if they would be willing to go home five minutes earlier um, where they would just go home. So at the beginning of the day, they still have to be there. The problem, to answer your question, Andy, is because we can't just take 850 kids in the middle school and put them all in the cafeteria because of social distancing rules, they'd have to go right to their classroom. So then those buses that still have the high school kids on them could then bring them over for the start time at 742 at the high school, 730. So that is a factor. Um, I, um, I'm in the process of you know talking to CSTA leadership to see how we can work together together to remedy that. But we would give them, if they have to not have kids, uh, if they have to have kids that first five minutes, we, we would then say to them, then you could take the five minutes at the end of the day and just go home. Because we do understand that the contract is the contract. Okay. Well, I mean, that's good. So it sounds like, you know, something to figure out, not so much a barrier, which is good. Barriers yeah. are bad work because we're buying barriers. But um, yeah. No, listen, our teachers have been wonderful from the beginning and trying to find ways to, to get kids back because they do, they care about them. I mean, I, we all remember what it was like, how many of our teachers would go around doing all the birthday shout outs and what, and some of our elementaries, those birthday parades or those just parades that they would go lasted like four hours long. So I do know that the teachers want to have the kids back and um, we'll just be very fair with the teachers on how we can, you know, back end it, you know, give it, letting them go home. So again, those are all things that would just have to be worked out. So, Two other questions on that, Tom. Do you know, um, do we have any idea of the time frame, the lead time to get, you know, enough barriers for everyone? Because obviously it's going to be a sudden influx of everyone ordering them. And the, the second part of that is, you know, my wife works in another district and and the current procedures are in between every class change, you know, the, the teacher is going around and wiping down the desk and the chair and everything else. And this now becomes, when you think about it, inside and outside, six more services that they're wiping down. Do we have any idea what, how much of an impact that will be to uh, our ability to implement this? No, honestly, we haven't even factored in the cleaning part of them yet uh, or wiping them down, how that would look with the student wipe their own uh, one down. But we do know that, Here's, the, here's the, 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 the elephant in the room. Do we go right now and purchase $200,000 worth of these if we don't have the means to bust these kids to school right now to be able to even need those barriers? I'm leaning towards saying, well, we need the barriers because 
I don't want to say this and then have people all of a sudden um, think bad of me, but they're not going to have kids vaccinated by next school year. So if we have to start out with the six foot, three foot with the barriers, then it's, it, it would either be hybrid or we have to have the barriers. But then again, they'd have to then eliminate the restrictions on buses for next year. So it's one of those things, Andy, where I'm trying to be fiscally responsible. Um, I want to be able to get all the kids back in. Eventually, we're going to have to spend the money and get these barriers. But in the meantime, we're just kind of hoping that may, at some point, maybe they're going to say there won't be restrictions on buses. But to your point, right now, we can get these in seven to 10 days. But in talking to our amazing director of facilities, um, that could change very quickly because soon at the drop of a hat, you could have hundreds of school districts trying to get these barriers. And then you know what happens with supply and demand. It's going to take a lot longer to get and they're gonna, the price could possibly double. So it's one of those guessing games that we're just all the superintendents are just trying to figure this out. Uh, Tom, when, whenever that conversation is done, I got a question. I think you're on, Mr. Lawyer. All right. Uh, are these are these fixed position or are these have to be carried by the by the the student? Well, so we would have them carry them because if not, it's the same conversation about the Chromebooks. Uh, you know, you could have a class set of Chromebooks, or each kid would get a Chromebook. So if they they have little handles on them, if you if you didn't do that and we had them each in a spot, then it would be over a million dollars that we would I need. I, I just wanted to clarify that. I, I, um, I hope everybody understands how ridiculous this is. Agree wholeheartedly, Mike. I mean, the, the, the concept of this by the powers to be is absolute and unequivocal insanity. Insanity. You know, they're looking at school districts spending all this money, no clue if it's working, no clue if it's going to work. How the hell are kids going to keep track? I mean, it, it, this is almost, Tom, this is not at you. This is about our leadership in government. Yes. This yes. is laughable. This is absolutely and unequivocally laughable. And, and I, can't believe, it all. I can't even believe they're directing this. I can't believe some Jamoke is sitting down in Albany <laughs> or sitting in Washington saying this. This, 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 this is unreal. And on top of it all, they're not addressing... The, 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 the problem in that you've got to get the students to the school in a Correct. safe, effective, efficient manner. They're Correct. forcing the, they're forcing the taxpayers the and then the teachers and the students and the staff and everybody involved to go above and beyond. And they haven't even solved the one problem that actually is the one that needs to be solved. How are you going to get the students to school? Well, to get them there on time. And to get their okay. work done and to give them, give them an environment that they, that they could actually be a student in. Well, well stated, Mike. You know, the, 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 they're focused on goddamn Dr. Zeus and his books, you know, rather than getting kids in the schoolroom. This is complete, complete and utter insanity. I think there's a higher power out there that, not a higher power, God, I don't want to give them that kind of credit. There, there, there's somebody out there that doesn't want the kids in school. And this, this, this hurdle is just, it's stunning. And I, and I apologize for getting angry, but th this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. $200,000 on top of everything else to do what? To not Mike, get the students to school. Stupid. Mike, every single taxpayer in this country should be angry with all due respect. Kids should be in school. The damn uh, restriction should be lifted and let's move on. This, 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 every single person, you should be angry. You should be spouting your anger and other people should be angry. We, you know, uh, just to add, uh, add one more thing to that. We just spent all this money in capital projects uh, adhering the state ed guidelines about airflow and fresh air return and everything else and not barriers and nothing above a certain height, you know, to, and now they're going to add for argument's sake, 150 linear feet of some form of acrylic plastic and everything that's going to prevent, prevent airflow. Like, to, to echo your points, it is, uh, it's absolutely, they're gonna keep putting restrictions in front of us until someone cries uncle or uh, pushes back strongly, so. And on top of that, unfortunately, 
you want to talk about massive inequities across the United States where there are some districts who have the ability where one of the parents possibly could be a stay at home parent that could drive the kids and their kids, their schooling looks definitely different. And every day, I, or you know, at least now it's down to every other day, I get phone calls from parents saying, how is that school doing it? How is that school doing it? Well, a big part of it is they're able to transport the kids to school, like what Mr. Lallier said. Just really comes down to that. Or how is that state doing it versus our state? And that's a simple answer. Well, it, it's done. I've said this before. My son and, and daughter-in-law, my granddaughter, is going to full time private school five days a week full day been going the whole time i have 90 kids in my federal building and a daycare and we don't have plexiglass up they don't wear masks okay they're kids and you know how many you know how many 90 kids you know how many covid cases we had positive for kids none zero Teachers, yes. Kids, zero. It's ridiculous. Absolutely and ridiculous. And it has yeah. nothing to do with science, Steve. That's the frustration. You know, when they want to say follow the science, that's good for them. And when it doesn't fit their need, uh, don't worry about the science. These are just the rules. It's complete. And I'll say it one last time. It's complete and utter insanity. Here, here. And I'll tell you, I'll, I, the frustration is beyond... I wish you could see me right now, but you can't, but it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I've had enough of this bullshit. Well, and, and so to Tom, the admin, and uh, most certainly all the teachers out there, um, this frustration is, hopefully it's obvious, and I don't have to say it, but it's not only not directed at you, we appreciate that much more what you're putting up with every day, because we're sitting here talking about it, you guys are out there living it every day, so uh it uh it is it is not the not not the uh, design of our making that's for sure no and, and and you know what you look at our plans from the very beginning um we we definitely wanted to create a safe environment but we did everything that we could possibly do um to get them in the elementary started out with you know um hybrid from the beginning high school we were fortunate in the middle school to we wanted to go with consistency so they, they actually haven't had any kids in their classrooms, the majority of them for, for seven months, but we're ready to get back and we're ready to start. I'm very excited that on April 5th, we are going to uh, have high school and middle school kids in our hallways again, not just the ones that don't have internet, but that's a great start. And I'm really hoping that they will lift the ban on the buses to let us get back to full capacity. I think I, um, many of you probably already saw Oswego County that was in the newspaper yesterday. They have zero people in the county uh, in the hospitals for COVID. Zero people in the hospital in the county for COVID. So the whole reason why we, we did all of these things is to make sure the hospitals don't get overridden. So I don't want to speak out of line or be disrespectful, but at this point, with the numbers being so low and pretty much every one of our staff members that wanted to be vaccinated has been vaccinated. Um, and I believe on the 11th is that four, there were like a, a set of 40 teachers that still needed to be and they got theirs 20 something days ago. And on the 11th um, down at CSI, they get their, their final uh, shot. So according to the CDC, two weeks after that, then they have that immunity. So I just, it's time to get back. It's time to start, you know, I, I'm thrilled about the sports spectators. I'm thrilled that now we work things out. Um, and so Mr. Haldeman feels comfortable in allowing spectators for a winter guard and for drum line. Um, and then, you know, I was having a conversation with Christine Enright to Kristen Enright today. Um, the confusion about what can we do for like, um, our um our musical well cuomo did put something out that says starting april 2nd for indoors we can have 33 percent capacity up to 100 people so we can do that inside now as well because i know before that they were planning on doing something on the football field you know for their musical so now we're gonna also then look at what could graduation look like what could um prom you know senior you know our ball look like we're just trying to get back to normal. Um, if numbers were to start to spike up again, then obviously we can tighten things up. But right now, it's looking pretty good. I have one last comment. Andy, thank you for clarifying. And I hope I mentioned that up front that I, 
I was attacking the leadership of government, not Tom and not his administration, first of all. Second of all, uh, I, I, I would ask that I hope Chris Todd and the district superintendents are screaming from the rooftops, which they're probably not, but let's get kids back in school. They should be. Every single one of them across the state. Chris Todd and all your colleagues, you should be screaming out loud to get kids back in school. And, and well, they, need, they need to be screaming about the root, the root problem. Let, let's get someone on, on the top of the mountain talking about the transportation piece. Until that gets solved, none of this is going to change. We could spend a million dollars on plastic. We can bubble wrap the whole school. It's not going to change. Yep. It, Tim, your, your point is well taken. It, it, it really is. It's going to take everyone. So just like we're talking about the fact that, you know, it, it seems even though whatever our personal opinions are about this, quote, COVID Relief Act, but at least there's money in there for schools. The problem is that somewhere between there and here, someone doesn't value our schools enough to actually use it for what it's dictated for. We need all the superintendents of schools. We need the school boards. We need the PTO groups. We need the transportation officials. We need everyone saying, if not now, then when? If we can't get kids on a bus now, when we have three vaccines and zero people in the hospital in Oswego County, like when does it ever return to normal? And the answer is simple. They won't answer the question because we have, we have abdicated our decision-making ability and, and too many people are growing used to it. And how sad that kids have to be asking, you know, what is the right time and when is it safe to be holding a prom or, or to even dance at a wedding, whatever it is. It's just, it's. Well, know, Andy, you're going to see one month from now, one month from now, the governor loses all of his powers, uh, his emergency powers. So then it's going to go back to the local governments. And that's what Ryan McMahon said today at his press conference, that when that happens, people are going to see that there's going to be a lot of changes and the local power will be, you know, control will be there. And then, then that's going to be the opportunity for the local uh, communities to regain what, what, getting back to a you know a sense of normalcy should look like right those powers should have been rescinded eight months ago six months ago Agreed. should have never been given to them well exactly a any other comments before we move into uh reports maureen thanks for the uh presentation and the update we got we got a little uh derailed there but it was related um, all right, we're going to move into item G, which is reports, and we'll start with uh, any unfinished, unfinished business. And it's not really unfinished business, but uh, Pearl had had a request, I think, through City BOCES uh, about whether or not we would want slash need uh, a presentation from City BOCES. And Pearl was the was the question: Did we want Mr. Todd slash Mr. Shepherd to attend either virtually or in person a meeting? Was that the question? Yes, that was the question. Um, and, and I will simply start the discussion by saying, not that I don't care about BOCES, I do love the programs, love what they're doing. Um, uh, I personally don't have any uh, need for it, frankly. We, I, there's enough, enough um, oars in the water that I don't need that one, but I'll open it up for discussion with others. I, I certainly don't need it because it's the same song and dance every time. So no, I do not need it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just yell at him like I normally. I you know, ten million dollars without an explanation. It's it's unfathomable. I don't need him. So would anyone object to the response from Pearl, Pearl being um, a kind of uh, submitted? whether it's PowerPoint or one the one page document of things they want us to know is great, but we don't at this time need an in-person uh, chat. Yes. I guess the simple question I would have Andy is, um, you know, going into the new year, what have they done to reduce during these pandemic times? Have they reduced any costs? I'd like to see that specifically outlined. All right. So Pearl, if, if you could just include that in the response that we don't need an in-person, but one specific question would certainly be, uh, you know, send us uh, some tactical and very specific things they've done to control, reduce costs, and uh, you know, assist uh, assist the component districts in doing the same. Okay. Anything else from the board? 
on, on that topic. All right, Mrs. Fishman, anything that you wanted to bring up? No, I don't have anything. All right. Um, I have a couple things I want to bring up. Number one would be in-person meetings um, through uh, discussion uh, chat with the board, just the certainly the desire that Mr. Cole Buffo and I spoke about and then uh, some of the board members as well is to get back to in-person meetings um, to echo the earlier conversation, if not now, then when. So the intent is that our next meeting, which would be the 22nd of March and from there on in, of course, subject to conditions changing with COVID, but uh, we'll, we'll go back to in-person meetings. Um, Tom, I, between you, Irena, and everyone else, if we could, I'd love to look at the possibility of being able to hold um, the 22nd or even after that, but meetings in the auditorium, I think it's a great chance for us to begin to utilize it. We also uh, need all the board members to see the finished product and everything. So if, if we can make that happen, great. If not, then I assume we'll go with our normal um, cafeteria meeting place, but. Well, Andy, it's actually a great idea that you bring that up because bringing students back, we're gonna be separating all the tables and whatnot um, in the cafeteria. So that would be a nightmare for, uh, for Hans and his crew to have to then change that after every board meeting. Um, yeah. But then the other thing, to your point, it's a great way to spread people out. Um, can I just say this? So I, I don't want the people that would think that we're going to go back to normal. We'll still do the live stream. But what we can't, what we don't have the capabilities of doing is both, where people in the audience were constantly putting in the chat, I can't hear what that board member said, because it wasn't built for that. It wasn't built for in-person and at the same time, the people at home that were trying to, you know, um, participate. So that, that, that just created a lot of headaches for people at home that were frustrated. They couldn't hear what people were saying. So since they're going back to in-person, and if we were able to utilize something like the auditorium, we could do social distancing, get a, a good amount of people to be able to come back to our meetings and not have to try to live in both those worlds because the technology does not adhere to that. Yep. Great. So, so Pearl, you can confirm with Tom as far as if, if we're able to use the auditorium, great. But uh, beginning with the next meeting, we'll be in person. Um, yeah, okay. and same, same normal that, time. That is our 10 and five year recognition. They've already received letters saying that it's going to be um, through Zoom. So we'll have to get word out to make sure everybody knows that it'll be held in the high school again. Yep, I totally understand, Pearl. And, and um, you know, if the majority of those, because it's their recognition, right? It's, so it should be what they wanted. They would rather stay remote. You know, if we can do a nice presentations, we'll certainly do whatever is most effective for that group that we're trying to honor. So, uh, okay. but we will meet in person. Um, all right. So then uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up was um, just a thank you. And I know this sometimes can, whatever, I don't want it to come off as, um, it's the only time we do a thank you, but it's a good it's a good time because we have people here and also a lot of people go back and do watch this after the fact. So, you know, we'll start with the, the front line. You know, all the teachers I know are working incredibly hard. It's a long year and here we are looking at making another uh, change, which is never easy on everyone. Um, but it goes beyond even that. It's all the parents and the students out there that are, are adapting to change. Um, and then I really wanted to recognize Tom and his cabinet. So, and, you know, it's, I know we've done this before, but Arena and her team and everything they've done with instructional technology in this time is really exceptional. And, and I understand it's frustrating. Anytime you deal in the, in the tech world, everyone thinks it can be done better, quicker, and cheaper. Um, I, I think Arena and team have done phenomenal. I think with all the uh, different permutations of rules and, and new things that have been put in front of them, it's fantastic. Um, Connie and Aaron, quite frankly, um, hold up uh, Tom and everything that he does in his job, and uh, they've been phenomenal. And Tom is not shy about praising all of you either. I don't want you to think that that's, that's why we're doing this. He does it often to the board, um, but we, we really do recognize all you're doing as well. Um, Paul and the uh, grounds crew and, and maintenance crew, everything they've been doing is incredible. I often think because my wife is a special education teacher that if 
if it's not difficult enough, imagine being a special education teacher uh, in during the pandemic. Um, and then Dr. Collins and everything she's doing with, with leading that group in that entire area. Maureen, everything with the budget, uh, as always, absolutely fantastic. Um, I think any district would look at uh, what you have done in conjunction with uh, the other staff and, and be thrilled and excited and, and frankly envious um, and just everyone. So major, major thank you to, to everyone from the bottom of my heart. Uh, most importantly, not just as a board member, but uh, because I'm a parent and my daughter's still a part of this district and uh, I, I couldn't ask for uh, a better district for her to, to be in. So thank you for that. With that, I'll stop the, uh, the thank yous and open it up to the rest of the board. We'll start with the student board rep. Uh, Jacob, did you have anything you wanted to bring up tonight? No, not today. All right. Thank you. And the rest of the board then, any topics or items for discussion? It's good, Andy. Yeah. No, he said he's good. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, Mr. Colabufo, superintendent's report. Yeah, I just wanted just to give a little recap. Um, Winter sports went pretty well. We started out right with um, some quarantine teams and then we kind of worked our way through that and we were able to, you know, successfully complete the winter season. Um, fall season two started today. So the football team, luckily we're going to get a couple of days in the sixties this week. So that's great. The uh, snow is breaking up on the, on the practice field. There is at this point, no snow and that we're expecting the turf to be fully, uh, melted uh, any day now we're gonna get a little rain that's gonna help uh it was um i great having jim Dranzik says great having spectators um it was weird for the kids not having spectators so that's it's great that, that they can see them in there and i just want to again touch real quickly there's a little bit of misconception where people say why do we need to have spectators this is really about the kids right it's for the kids but i played three sports and i knew how much it meant for my parents who started me out when i was really little so that was touching to me to be able to see my mom and my dad you know and my grandparents uh, you know in the crowd so I want to say, I don't want the parents to be left out of that. It does mean a lot for them, but it also means a lot for the kids to be able to see that support from their parents. Um, and I'm just so happy that we're able to, you know, move back in that direction. And I'm so happy that Winter Guard and Drumline, um, they've got the blessing to have spectators. And, and, and again, we're doing it the right way, two per kid. We've got the capacity and we're doing that with the temperature checks and the whole nine yards. Hey, um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just on that, I wanted, I forgot to mention this and I want to make sure to relay it. I had a parent literally call me tears of joy. They were so thrilled to be able to watch online. They, they couldn't go in person, um, but to watch online. So again, to Arena, and I think it's probably Dean that does most of the recording, but the comparison of what we as a district have offered as far as the online streaming versus others that are one, charging for it, and two, the quality is just horrific. Uh, again, top notch. Couldn't couldn't be more thrilled uh, to see what you and the the staff put together on that. So thank you. Yeah, I, that's part that kind of blows me away. That there's many districts in our county where parents there's been no complaints about lack of in person learning or or no spectators. And some of those districts they actually charge people to to watch um, the live streams. So. I got to give a huge shout out. Jim Dranzak does an amazing job praising Dean Schluter all the time, because if you haven't seen it yet, I would tell anybody to go to the athletic page on our central square website. And I'm going to tell you right now that rivals any uh, ESPN, you know, game that's done. It's amazing. The way he zooms in, zooms out, catches everything is awesome. So I'm glad that you said that Andy, that's true. It's top notch. Um, big thing here. There's uh, the governor. Last week, he had a, a slide and then he, he, he all of the media ran with it and said that the travel advisory is over, that if you've been vaccinated um, and you've had your second vaccination shot after two weeks after that second shot, you can go wherever you want, go to Florida, go wherever, and you don't need to take the, um, the first, the first uh, test, sorry, the first test you know, three days before returning to New York. And then once you return on the fourth day of quarantine, you can test out of it with a second um, COVID negative test. 
So everybody was excited. And there were a lot of staff members, a lot of teachers were emailing me saying, oh my God, my wife's a teacher as well. I'm a teacher. Does this mean where we're going to go? I'm like, hold on. So I quickly told Lynn Dowler that the governor oftentimes comes out and says stuff at press conferences, but until we actually get his official executive order, it's not in place yet. So now today is Monday. As of today, I checked an hour ago with our lawyers. He still has not put out an executive order. So mid-February, he was saying he was probably going to do away with this. That got a lot of people's hopes up. That never happened. So now there's a lot of people saying, what is the point of being part of the 1B category and having these vaccinations if they still, in, in let's say Oswego County, they still have to be quarantined if they come in contact with a positive case? And the whole traveling and whatnot, that doesn't apply to them. So they can't because they'd come back from spring break and they'd have to go into quarantine for four days, which that would be considered a gift of public funds for the district to allow them to, you know, if they're choosing to travel. So I just wanted to say that as of right now, no executive order changing the travel advisory. To be fair, the, the governor has been busy with other things. He has. That is true. That is true. Yeah, like um, shots. What was that? Like giving shots, like he's got time to be giving shots. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's basically, Andy, all the things that I wanted to discuss right now. Secondary level is diligently working together to make uh, April 5th very successful. And that's uh, just a big viewer giving shout outs. Huge shout out, first of all, Dave Bartholomew, to be able to feed everybody through all of these crazy times. But uh, also, especially... Um, Paul, uh, Johnny Pierce and what he's doing ahead of transportation, because we put out the survey to the parents. And then just like the last survey, we had parents going, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. We had to have a cutoff because right now, like the board members were saying, the maximum is 22 kids on the bus. So he can build these routes for 22. And then all of a sudden, five more parents say, I changed my mind. I want to have my kid come in. So that just throws off that whole bus run. Then he has to kind of carve that run and then try to make it into another run. So if any parents are still wondering, why don't they have the ability to change at any time? Again, we have the largest school district geographically in the whole entire state of New York, and that's 200 square miles. People were saying to me, what about Union Endicott? They've been having barriers. They, they busting the kids in, so I found out. I called very, very nice superintendent, and she told me that they've got four or five elementaries, middle school and high school, roughly 3,800 students, very similar to us. Um, and what they do is they actually have different elementary times for each of their buildings. So they space them. Their district is just shy of 40 square miles. So it's like, it's like 25 minutes or 30 minutes between each run. If we did that, we'd have to have about an hour and 25 minutes between each. So inevitably we would have an elementary building ending at about seven o'clock at night um, and high school. Um, obviously we would have to be able to have 12 bus runs to be able to pull something like that off. So I know a lot of parents brought up that district and other districts. I did my due diligence. I checked on all of that. Unfortunately, because of the 22 person on a bus and the fact that we can't space hours apart for each school, that just wasn't doable. Thus, hey, Tom, if I could just yeah. um, cut in for one second, I, and I don't know how this is even feasible, but I, and I'm sure it's something that you've thought of. I think we've talked about it. Um, it. One of the frustrating things as a parent in the district, you know, with respect to the limited transportation issue is, you know, I put my kids on the bus every morning and there's a total of about six to eight kids on the bus. Um, yeah. And now I realize that parents sign up and they say their kids are going to ride the bus, but is there, there any way to make, you know, kind of put their month, put, I guess, put their kid where their mouth is in terms of, you know, if your kid doesn't ride the bus consistently for two weeks, like they lose their spots. So there's just got to be some way to actually, you know, it'd be interesting to see how many of those seats remain empty, you know, when we're, when we're creating these bus runs and limiting these kids with the number of days they can be in the school when there's, you know, half the seats on the bus are empty on a daily basis. That is the frustrating part, Christy, because legally we can't say to them they lose their spot because then inevitably we'd have to be paying them mileage to drive their kids, which, so we have well, to be- Well, but, but do we have to? I mean, they're still, they're still getting virtual education at home. I mean, it's not like they have no way to get an education if they, you know, are not using the bus. I mean, normally, obviously, that would be an issue when we're busing all kids. But I'm just, 
you know, it, it's just very frustrating. I mean, yesterday I put the kids on the bus and there was literally two other kids on the bus and my kids are one of the last pickups, you know, and it's just one of those things where, you know, I understand it. I understand everybody's schedules are different, but this isn't, this is something I've noticed throughout the year this year, you know, that there is more empty seats on the bus than there is seats with kids on the bus. You bring up a very um, good point. Uh, John Pierce is, is frequently checking the attendance and then calling those parents because what we can't do is ever get to the point where we say to the parents, well, if you're not bringing your kids, it can never look like for the parents that are bringing their kids, their kids have in person. For the parents that can't bring their kids and their kids are gonna be remote, there would be lawsuits there. I hear what you're saying and I agree with you 100% that it is very frustrating when I drive to a school and I see a bu the doors open up and six kids get out, yet he built that for 22 kids because parents said that their kids needed it. But Aaron Phillips is doing a really good job and in working with the principals to connect to those parents to say, you all want more in-person time, help us deliver that to you because clearly you are driving your kids right now. So if you can commit to that, we can get more kids in, all of the kids in, but you bring up a really good point. Are they driving their kids or are they staying remote? giving the indication that the kids are being driven in. No, they're driving their kids. Their kids are coming to school. I mean, our remote kids, 72% of the kids at the elementary school, Mike, are, are in person. So the 28% of them have been rock solid uh, remote. Those 72% make their way to school. Okay, so they are getting driven in. All right, so there's, there's commitment there. All right, just want to make a point. Yeah. Thus concludes my superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. Colabufo. All right, moving into <clears throat> item H, items for action discussion. I'll make a motion to approve item H1, which is the approval of the first reading of proposed district's policies. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Loyer. This is the first reading, so should we approve, uh, we'll vote at the next meeting. After the second reading, they become our policies. Any discussion on H1? All right, Mr. Martin, yes, Mrs. Fishman. Yes. Mr. McCarthy. Yes. Mrs. Nickerson. Yes. Mr. Loyer. Yes. Mr. Patch. Yes. And Mrs. Sundet. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, can I get a motion for item H2, the approval of the public employee emergency health plan? I'll make the motion. I'll make that. Motion by Mr. Loy. Can I get a second? I'll second. I believe that was Mrs. Nickerson. Any discussion on H2? Yet, yet, yet another massive comprehensive plan that the uh, governor has had us develop. That's my comment. Any, anything else before we vote? <laughs> Mr. Martin's a yes, Mrs. Fishman. Yes. Mr. McCarthy. Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yes. Mr. Loyer? Yes. Mr. Patch? Yes. And Mrs. Sundet? Yes. Can I get a motion for item H3, approval of the resolution for high speed communication services? I'll make motion. the motion. Second. That was a motion by Mrs. Sundet, second by Mrs. Fishman. Any discussion? Mr. Martin's a yes. Mrs. Fishman? Yes. Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yes. Mr. Loyer? Yes. Mr. Patch? Yes. And Mrs. Sundet? Yes. All right. Uh, so a couple housekeeping things before we make this kind of final motion. We're going to make a motion for executive session here in a minute. There will be no action to follow. So it will be the close of the public meeting. We will not re-enter into this Zoom meeting or anything to officially close out the meeting. We will simply take the, the vote to close the public meeting at the end of our executive session. Um, so initially this executive session will include the entire board, Mr. Colabufo and Mrs. Galvan. Um, at the end of the executive session, we will ask Mrs. Galvan and Mr. Colabufo to leave uh, and it will be only the board. And so with that, I will make a motion that the Central Square School District hereby move into executive session for the purposes of discussion tenure of 10 particular people, an update on negotiations with CSTA and discussions around the superintendent's contract um, with no action to follow. Can I get a second? Second. 
Second. Second. Second by Mr. Loy. Any discussion? All right, and for the board, there's a separate link. Uh, we'll take just about three or four minutes, uh, allow a fluid adjustment break, and then we will join that second link. Mr. Martin's a yes. Mrs. Fishman? Yes. Um, Mr. McCarthy? Yes. Mrs. Nickerson? Yeah. Mr. Loyer? Yes. Mr. Patch? Yes. And Mrs. Sundit? Yes. Thank you, Pearl. Uh, Mr. Cole Grupo will, or one of us will get you the information as who who votes and closes the uh, executive session and meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you in person on the 22nd. Bye. Have a good night.